Good morning. Um, welcome to Black Hat Briefings Day 1. Uh, this is Pico DMA, DMA Attacks at Your Fingertips by Ben Bloxell and Joel Sandin. Please turn off your cell phones or put them on vibrate so we don't have to hear your voicemail. Thank you much. All right, thank you, sir. All right, everybody, thanks for coming. Welcome to Pico DMA, DMA Attacks at Your Fingertips. Just to say a little bit about us, uh, my colleague Ben Blacksell was a principal security consultant with Montesano and later NCC Group, and he's currently an independent hardware researcher. I was also with Montesano and later NCC Group as a senior security consultant, and I'm a principal at Lata Cora, and we help startups bootstrap their security practice. Just to give you an agenda about the talk, we're gonna give you some background on DMA attacks. We're gonna talk about a wireless DMA implant that we developed called Pico DMA. We'll do a deep dive on FPGA, PCI, and DMA engineering. We'll talk about the radio module, hardware, and software. Try to do a live demo, um, conclusions, and future work. So what do we mean when we say a DMA attack? DMA is short for direct memory access, and these attacks traditionally involved an attacker that gets physical access to a device, a workstation, or a laptop. An attacker targets high-speed expansion ports like Thunderbolt and Express Card on the device and uses hardware to read and write physical memory. When you're performing a DMA attack, you can recover sensitive data from physical memory, like cryptographic secrets and passwords, and you can also make changes to running software on the device to backdoor the target machine, and that can allow you to read files, bypass authentication if the machine is locked, essentially compromise the machine entirely. And there's a lot of great previous work here. I'm just gonna cover a few talks, but there's a lot more out there. Um, Joe Fitz really kicked things off sort of in the public sphere of research with uh, his Slot Screamer project. And he took a, a USB 3380 reference board, weaponized it, turns it into a very stealthy DMA hardware implant. And um, you can see it on the right, it's a PCI Express card. Uh, looks very innocuous. If you install it into a server and you have physical access, you can connect to the USB port and read four gigs of memory. Um, Othfrisk has been working on the uh, PCI Leech uh, DMA attack suite since 2016, and um, I really can't do it justice in just one slide. Uh, the capabilities are amazing. It uh, not only allows uh, read writes and searches of physical memory, supports multiple hardware platforms, but it has a whole suite of software implants that you can use to uh, compromise a target and perform various attacks. Um, and it's not just a research project, PCI Leech, uh, it's very reliable, you can use it on real engagements. Um, it's robust and uh, really a, a remarkable tool. And uh, there's a series of research presentations by, and I'm gonna mispronounce the names, I apologize, uh, Fabien Perigot, er Alexandra Gazet, and Geoffrey Cesarni uh, from uh, Synactive and Airbus. And they looked at firmware on uh, HP Enterprise uh, Integrated Lights Out firmware. Um, identified vulnerabilities that allowed them to compromise the, that firmware from a uh, management network segment, and then they used DMA attacks from the ILO to uh, pivot into the host of that machine. Um, so when I say that DMA attacks are traditionally performed with physical access, this is something that definitely breaks the trend. Um, really groundbreaking research. Um, but not only was it groundbreaking research, they also added integration with PCI Leech and demonstrated how you could perform these attacks using PCI Leech, and we relied heavily on that integration for our, our own work, so definitely check that stuff out. Uh, I also wanna mention, you know, um, a keystroke injection tools, hit implants. Um, I think we're all familiar with these. The Hack5 USB rubber ducky is a good example that's commercially available. Um, it's a lot like a DMA attack in some ways. If you have physical access to a machine that's unlocked, you can inject keystrokes, exfiltrate data, compromise the machine. Um, there's been a lot of research in this space, and um, you know, I'd say the thing that really sets apart recent projects is a uh, greater degree of deception in the design of the, um, the, the hardware itself and wireless capabilities. So Turnip School is a good example. This was a project by Michael Osman, Dominic Spill, and Jared Boone. And they built a you know, USB cable that had wireless capabilities. If you plug the cable into your machine, someone with wireless access to that cable can inject keystrokes. Um, there's the USB Ninja, developed by Vincent Liu, Kevin Mitnick, and uh, folks from Proxgrind. It's commercially available, very similar. Um, the Cactus Wid from Luca Bongioni, 
Um, really cool wireless keystroke injecting tool, commercially available, and he's also developing the WID Elite, which integrates a SIM 800L GSM modem, so you can access it from anywhere. Uh, the Maltronics internal keylogger is pictured on the right there on the bottom. Um, it's an internal keylogger. Uh, what sets it apart is it's very tiny. It's uh, one centimeter squared. It's persistent. You put it into the keyboard permanently. Um, looks very innocuous, you know, to someone who, uh, to an untrained eye, it might not look like anything malicious, but it captures every keystroke that flows through that keyboard and lets you retrieve them wirelessly. So, really a lot of advancements in this space that I think are relevant to the research that we've done. Um, DMA attacks, they're not just, uh, sorry, DMA is not just for attackers. Um, it's an invaluable tool for forensic analysis. Um, you know, you can capture memory from a machine and then use tools like volatility and recall um, to extract the memory contents of running processes. From there, you can look at uh, what files those processes have open, uh, what network connections they're making, and do root cause, cause analysis uh, in the event of an incident. Uh, just to give you a concrete, a practical sort of end-to-end -end DMA attack example using PCI Leech, um, Jean-Christophe Delaunay on the Synactive blog has a really nice write-up about a consulting engagement he was on where he used PCI Leech and he was tasked with compromising a hardened Windows workstation so the IOMMU was enabled. Um, other protections were in place. Uh, he first was able to reset the BIOS to disable the IOMMU, um, which didn't prevent the machine from booting. Unfortunately, that wasn't part of the measurements that were being taken before the machine booted. Um, once he was able to boot it with the IOMMU disabled, um, he physically opened the device. You can see a picture here of that laptop open, connected to an M2 slot in the laptop, uh, connected an FPGA, I should say, and then used the PCI tool, PCI leech tool that I mentioned uh, to patch the memory on that laptop and actually unlock it and log in. So it was a successful engagement uh, from his perspective and a really cool write-up that you should check out. And just to talk about the goals for this project, um, at, the onset, uh, at the onset, our goal was to develop a DMA-capable hardware implant, and we wanted it to be small. Our idea was the implant would be persistent, so you would install it once and leave it in place, um, and we wanted to incorporate wireless capabilities, so you didn't have to have wireless access, or sorry, physical access uh, when actually performing the attack, you could access it wirelessly. And just in the interest of time for the initial prototype, we really wanted to use off-the-shelf hardware, if possible. And our hope was to develop proof of concept demonstrations of new attack and defense scenarios, and also to release the software and documentation um, so other researchers will have low-cost building blocks for new applications, offensive and defensive alike. Um, we developed an initial prototype. This is the Pico DMA. Um, as you can see, it's quite small, fits on a keychain, you can wear it as an earring. Um, it's DMA capable, so you can do 64-bit streaming reads and 64-bit um, writes. And we also incorporate an FPGA-enabled um, search capability, so the FPGA can actually um, search for words in memory that may be interesting to you. Um, it's PCI Leech compatible, so all the attacks there uh, you can potentially uh, mount using this hardware device, and we built it using commodity hardware. Uh, the Pico DMA is highly embeddable. Um, we see here on the right it's installed in a machine. It's really easy to install. You just need access to an M2 A or E key expansion slot, or you can use adapters to put it into um, other slots. Um, Fits in small places. Here it's installed in a Intel NUC, which is pretty palatial as far as the implant is concerned. There's plenty of room. Um, that machine is actually sitting next to me here. And um, the uh, Pico DMA supports out of band access. So it doesn't rely on network access on the target machine. Um, if the target machine doesn't have network access, that's okay. Um, the Pico, Pico DMA um, has its own network access. So it's small and self-reliant and uh, hopefully suited to a big set of targets. And so, you know, wireless implants like these, they decouple the act of installing the implant from performing the actual DMA attack. You can install the implant and then weeks or months later actually perform exploitation. And uh, it gives an attacker more possibilities as far as deployment is concerned. Um, interdiction attacks are a good example. An attacker can intercept a device when it's in transit and powered down and um, install a physical implant or a software implant for that matter. 
Um, plenty of organizations rely on third-party contractors as you know, hands and eyes technicians for working on servers and data centers and so on. Um, an attacker with temporary physical access to a server that on rack it, uh, doing routine ma maintenance can install the implant, put it back on the rack, and then that attacker can later um, use that implant to, to actually perform the attack. Um, you can imagine scenarios where an attacker may have legitimate physical access to a machine. An example is, uh, you know, an employee that has access to a workstation uh, as part of their job duties and then they, they leave the organization. Um, but before they leave it, um, they leave a little bit of hardware behind. And when that workstation is issued to a new employee, um, that, pre that former employee would then have access to uh, perform the attack. And of course, organizations that are provisioning hardware, they could install hardware, uh, an implant like this, and do for remote forensics later on. And the decoupling allows, uh, you know, new attack variations, new variations on existing attacks that we've seen um, in past research. Um, we don't need access to the machine when it's live anymore. And that means we can capture, you know, ephemeral credentials um, that may only be in memory at certain times. Examples are, you know, GPG agent uh, loading keys into memory or SSH agent. Um, of course, session cookies associated with sessions on the machine are a good target. Um, and it's not an attack that necessarily happens at a single point in time. You can do ongoing profiling. You can collect activity logs from the target, screenshots, stuff like that over time um, because the implant stays put. And because you're installing it and leaving it in place, any protections, and there are some in various operating systems disabling external ports when the machine is locked, those protections don't apply in this context. And we've already sort of alluded to some of the key ingredients here. Um, we need an FPGA platform for actually doing DMA. Um, in order to facilitate wireless access, we need a radio module. Um, it's probably not going to be the same device, so we need a way to connect them. Software, obviously. And uh, this brings me to the Pico EVB, which is a commercially available FPGA platform from RHS Research LLC. Here's a picture of it. Um, as you can see, it literally fits on a fingertip. Uh, it's very tiny. And it's an excellent DMA platform. Uh, so we have a block diagram on the right. Um, it's commercially available, like I mentioned. It was launched on Crowd Supply. It runs about 220 bucks. Um, it has a powerful FPGA on it, Arctic 7 XC7A50T. Um, it's really tiny. It's 2.2 uh, by 3 centimeters. Um, as I mentioned, it uh, plugs into M2 AE slots. So, you know, a lot of flexibility as far as where you can install it. And really important for us is it comes with expansion capabilities out of the box. So, if you look at the uh, block diagram, there are uh, multi-purpose I.O. connectors and high-speed digital I.O. connectors over there on the left side and um, so, so you, you can interface it with other devices. What it doesn't come with is any actual way to do DMA. So there's a lot of software engineering that goes into that and uh, I'll uh, send it over to Ben to talk about building the prototype. Thanks, Joel. Okay. So, um, the basic challenge with this is PCI is high bandwidth and um, low latency and PCI transactions can complete in the order of 10 microseconds and remote communication of course uh, we're talking milliseconds and uh, you know Wi-Fi maybe we have enough bandwidth for these kind of transactions but something like LoRa radio we, the bandwidth is so much smaller it's hundreds and maybe thousands of bytes per second. Um, so our platform at high level, it's uh, similar to previous platforms that we use an FPGA to um, talk to the PCI Express bus. Um, where we differ is previous platforms um, basically queue, FP, uh, queue PCI um, requests on the FPGA, and we do a lot more processing on the, on the FPGA. Um, yeah, and we, we provide a simple interface for doing DC, uh, PCI DMA, and, and we provide an yeah, expose a spy interface. And um, when we were initially thinking about it, we went through a couple of ideas. Um, the, the initial uh, idea that a lot of people talk about is putting a soft core on the FPGA. And the reason we rejected this idea is it, it, it looked like it was going to re require a lot more engineering, basically. Um, to get the performance out of a soft core to, to uh, process P uh, PCI packets, um, you're either going to need to add custom instructions or a lot of on-chip buffering. Um, and since we had a, set fi a fixed set of functionality, we decided just to implement those uh, instructions directly. Um, 
we decided still to include a microcontroller in the system. That gives us flexibility um, with remote communication and um, potentially updating the FPGA and, and these kind of things. Um, for a future uh, platform idea, um, if we used a specialized PCB, for instance, and a lower cost FPGA, which is possible, um, the price uh, per unit could easily be below $50. So there's definitely room for um, improvement there, but um, we wanted to get moving quick and with off-the-shelf components, uh, yeah, we could make progress pretty quickly. Um, okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, what we require from the PCI spec and what we're gonna be using um, to perform these PCI DMA attacks. Um, I'm gonna start off simple. PCI connectors, I'm sure you're all familiar. There's like standard connectors, um, which are you know in desktop and server class motherboards have been for tens of years. Um, yeah, maybe even over 20 years now. Um, but now, nowadays you also have the M.2 um, slot, which is ubiquitous in mobile devices. Um, this is partly from uh, high performance SSDs becoming much more common, um, but it, it's also used for things like, uh, you know, Wi-Fi cards, um, um, which uh, use a slash E key, SSDs use M key. Um, the keying is done by a physical notch. If you've ever looked at the connector, um, yeah, there's a physical notch that um, prevents you from putting uh, different um, PCI uh, cards into different slots. Um, the actual pins themselves are differ differential pairs of wires. They mean, this means if you're sending like a high bit, one wire will contain a high value and the other one will contain a low value. This um, helps uh, reduce noise, electrical noise and things like that, um, improve signal integrity. Um, and the devices will uh, perform link width negotiation, which allows uh, basically some of the pairs to not be working. Uh, interesting, this kind of allows you to do, uh, to mechanically alter the connectors. So for instance, if uh, there's, there's interesting cases of people previously wanting to put graphics cards in motherboards that only have a single um, PCI lane slot and they've kind of like chopped up. And you can do something similar with M.2 connectors as well where you sand down the notch in, in between and then you can shove a, um, an M.2 connector in a different, in a different slot. But um, you can also just use an adapter. And uh, there's, uh, there's adapters for all the different um, types of PCI Express um, forms. And M.2 M uh, slots have also different uh, uh, different additional interfaces um, that they supply, so USB, I2C, etc. cetera. Um, for instance, the A slash E keying that um, wireless cards use and, and the Pico EVB that we're using as our base um, has USB on it as well. So the adapter in the middle of, of the image there, um, you can see that it's got an exposed USB header and that allows you to route back USB to the host. For our cases, of course, we only care about the PCI, uh, PCI Express, so we don't care about the USB. Um, but if you do, yeah, you're gonna have to read those signals externally. Um, the PCI Express terminology talks about endpoint devices connected to a root complex. That's just, uh, you know, your endpoint talking to a host device. Um, it is packet-based, but it, it looks, when you're, when you're working with it, it looks a bit more like a, a traditional bus in that you're performing um, memory reads, writes, um, to memory location store, to IO ports, rather than just sending packets with data. Um, there's a physical layer and a data link layer, and we're gonna not talk about those because that's gonna be handled by the FPGA um, vendor provided code. Um, and uh, we're gonna just talk about the transaction layer which sits on top. Um, the other thing to point out is uh, PCI Express is you know, designed for memory transfers, and they're all usually host initiated, um, but obviously for our use case, we're gonna be initiating them on device and um, getting the completions back from the host. So the summary, the summary of this slide is basically there is no security built into PCI Express. Um, that's kind of a valid threat model, right? It's a high bandwidth protocol that's for physical interconnect. Um, it's not normally exposed to attackers or, attackers or anything like that. Um, but that's, that's why, uh, uh, the basis of why uh, PCI Express DMA attacks can work. Um, the only identification it done is there's a 16-bit physical slot address that's um, dictated by the host and, um, and uh, is, will be reported back to the device but is not configured by the device. And there's a device ID which is read from the um, device's configuration space. And um, that is, uh, is written by the device and that's why these DMA attacks can actually work is that um, it's self-reported, right? You can report any device ID and a lot of uh, um, DMA attacks work by reporting device IDs of devices that have special privileges such as bus mastering which is the term for being able to initiate DMA requests in PCI. 
Um, okay, so TL, uh, transaction layer packets is a bunch of different ones. We only really care about the memory transactions, the read and write to memory um, that we're going to be initiating from our device, and we'll receive back completions. There's a number of other ones. Um, configuration, read and write, TLPs will, will be going on. Those will be handled by the FPGA um, that we, we won't have to code ourselves. Um, there's a number of other requests, such as I request those. Those are uh, mostly for uh, legacy compatibility. There's probably um, attack surface there, um, uh, but it's not something we're going to go into in this in this talk. Um, so this is kind of an outline of an example TLP. Um, I'm just going to go over some key fields. There's a length field in the top right-hand corner. This is um, a length of the number of 32-bit words, data words, um, data payload in, in the TLP. Um, it's 10 bit, and um, the length combined with the address mustn't cross a four kilobyte boundary, which we managed to do during uh, design. And the annoying thing about working in PCI Express is a number of hosts tend to allow you to kind of work to be providing incorrect, uh, you know, requests, and then suddenly they'll decide, okay, you're, you know, not working anymore. You're something's gone wrong with your device, and then they'll shut off access. It makes it very hard to debug issues because you know it's working, and then stops working randomly. But uh, yeah, so you, there's, there's lots of kind of small things along the spec that you need to check out like that. The next field along, uh, going right to left on the top line is the type field. That's pretty self-explanatory. That's just a TLP type. Um, and then there's a two-bit bit field, uh, the format field, which uh, just signifies if the payload contains data, and also if the address type is a 32-bit or 64-bit uh, address. So the way the addressing works in um, PCI Express is if you uh, only want to address either write or read to a 32-bit address, you have to use a 32-bit um, address. You can't pack it into a 64-bit value. Um, uh, otherwise, again, it will potentially accept your um, tra transactions, but then might decide you're um, you know, um, a damaged device or something. Um, the, ne the next line down we have on the right um, the byte enables, that just selects whether the um, bytes in the first uh, data 32-bit um, word and the last one are enabled. And that allows you to do non-32-bit word addresses. Um, so basically, the address that you provide, as you can see, um, must be aligned to 32 bits. The address counts from the 31st bit down to the, down to the second rather than the zero, the zero bit. Um, Skipping tag, if we go over to request ID, the request ID is the physical ID I mentioned um, earlier. This will be set or, or relayed from the host back to the endpoint, and then um, the endpoint should use this on request. Again, this is another thing. You can not provide the correct request ID, and it may work for a while, and then it will stop working. So yeah, good to, re good to provide the right request ID. Um, and the tag field is the last field in the middle in the second row. Um, that basically uh, is a, an identifier that an endpoint can associate with streams of um, packets or, or within a particular packet, and it, it basically defines the ordering used with the PCI specification. So, for instance, um, different different tags, um, the the packets may re completions may return at different times. There's no ordering guaranteed there, but um, packets relating to a, the same tag will always come back um, in the same order. It's and it's there's, by default there's a five bit tag allowed, so that's thirty to do different values, but there's extensions that allow up to eight bits. And it's mostly a performance thing, but um, it's something we will use. Okay, so now um, a quick overview of the FPGA concepts we'll be using. Um, FPGAs, uh, if you're not familiar, are synchronous circuits as programmable logic gates. This means um, you can emulate circuitry on an integrated chip. It runs very fast. Um, they commonly used for a simulation of ASICs and and also to work on um, I.O. that's very uh, timing constrained, either very quickly or requires very precise timing. Um, there's a wide range of costs for F uh, FPGAs. I've, I've put a few up here. Um, the Lattice ECP5 on the left is uh, not the cheapest FPGA you can get. You can get much cheaper ones. And similarly on the right, the Xilinx VU9P um, is not the most expensive FPGA you can get. The thing they have all have in common, these ones, is they all provide the PCI Express um, uh, tools that we need to do DMA attacks. Obviously, for our case, we can just go for the cheaper ones. The reason why we're not using um, the Lattice ECP5 here is just um, for tooling reasons, and also, um, obviously, the Pico EVB comes with the, uh, the Xilinx FPGA in the middle there. 
Um, the reason you don't see more FPGA um, uh, tooling, uh, sorry, or more FPGA, uh, you know, implement things implemented on FPGAs, it's just they're, they can be a real pain to develop with, um, as I'm sure anyone will agree who's worked with them. Um, so the, the, the way, way the FPGA works, uh, the device itself has lookup tables. These are, um, you know, similar to lookup tables in a, in a, what a, when you're designing software or something like that. Um, the difference is that they change value according to some clock that's uh, routed along the FPGA. Um, there's also hard cores in the FPGA. It's not just lookup tables. Um, and the reason you want these is uh, things that are implemented in hardened cores require a lot less device space and can potentially operate at a much higher frequency. Um, so all the PC, uh, FPGAs on the previous slide have um, PCI Express controllers, and uh, that will take care of the physical layer and data link layer uh, for PCI Express, which is why we didn't talk about it in the, in the last section. Um, some, some implementations, some libraries provided by the vendors will also do the transaction layer processing for you as well, but it, that's something obviously we want to control ourselves as we're gonna be doing sl something slightly non-standard. Um, so designing for, uh, with FPGAs, uh, as I mentioned, can be a pain. The tooling is improving, but feels like a real step back um, to software development. Um, there are some uh, interesting open source projects such as Yosis and, and other things out there, but it, it's still not on par with yeah, software design. Um, in particular, um, you know, the approach you take designing and coding and debugging is, is different, and um, bugs can be a real pain to, uh, uh, to discover, as I'll show a bit later um, on an FPGA. Um, and so the best way to approach this is similar to a software development approach. You wanna be writing what's called test benches for FPGAs, similar to unit tests, um, early on to make sure you're, you, know, you verify your behavior. There's two main classes of design in FPGA. There's register transfer level and um, behavioral synthesis. Register transfer level is somewhat um, analogous to uh, uh, assembly in that you're, you're writing very specific design that um, you're gonna know the exact timing and things like that. And behavioral synthesis is more like working with a high level language. Um, this trade-offs to the approach, but using behavioral synthesis can be a lot more productive, similar as, similar as using a high level language can be. Um, but often, uh, the issue, one of the issues of working with an FPGA is you're quite constrained by what you can fit on there. And then, so to get the performance and to get the um, uh, low utilization of the re device resources, um, you often want, want to work on a register transfer level, um, which is what we did. Um, although we used, uh, we used Clash there's, and there's other um, tools as well, Chisel, these all compile down to um, Verilog VHDL, which are the RTL um, languages. Um, and the benefit here is just you get you know modern language support, and you and you can test things uh, almost as a software approach before you test it on device, um, which you can do somewhat with traditional tooling, but it's it's a lot smoother and um, a lot smoother. And the other ma major benefit is um, uh, yeah, some of this tooling can prevent clock domain errors. So when you're running logic on an FPGA, you're often dealing with multiple clock domains. So for instance, for our use case, we have um, PCI Express running, running at one clock domain. We have, we're gonna have Spy running at a different clock domain and we're gonna have logic in the middle that's running at a third clock domain. If you aren't careful and you're transferring data across these clock domains, you can easily introduce um, errors um, such as metastability issues where um, signals appear to have different values different places and it becomes dependent on, and the, the values you receive on things become dependent on the, uh, the physical uh, uh, length of wires in the FPGA, which is obviously not what you want. Um, and um, traditional tooling does, does uh, of course, allow you, uh, pr you know, report when there are errors along these lines and things like that. But, um, but some of these, this new, to new tooling has specific, for instance, type safety that um, prevents it, which is, you know, useful. The, the downside of doing this is there's an additional compilation step in the process, which, um, you know, when things go wrong, it, became, it can be harder to find out where in the stack it went wrong. Okay, so this is what um, an FPGA uh, toolchain looks like. This is actually um, Xilinx Vivado. Um, as I mentioned, they're all like proprietary for their, and they all uh, work only for specific devices. Um, so synthesis and implementation are basically the compilation step for an FPGA. Um, synthesis it takes your code and produces a netlist, which is similar to um, IR in, in the software world. And then the implementation step takes that IR and makes it device, device specific to generate a bitstream that you can then program an FPGA with. Um, 
the unusual thing about this particular view is this, this is a, a block view that I think is quite unique to the um, Xilinx to uh, Vivado tool. There might maybe other vendors provide something similar, I'm not sure. Um, the benefit of working, so when we are coding the various modules, we are working at the uh, you know, Verilog, the HDL level, but um, it can be useful to have a block view like this where you're connecting the components visually because as you can see, there's, a, there's quite a few like, inputs and outputs on various modules. This is actually not the largest um, or the, the module with the largest number of inputs and outputs on the device. And it can be a real pain just disconnecting, connecting things in source code, which just um, is basically, you know, like writing out the same name. Imagine providing a function argument to like 100 different places, just repeating doing it. It can be tiring. And this allows you to um, connect disconnect wires very easily. And the other thing I want to mention here is you might be able to see it, I'm not sure how large it is, um, on, the, on the right there's an integrated logic analyzer and that's how we're going to debug stuff on the FPGA. So yeah, when you have an integrated logic analyzer on the FPGA, um, you can set it up to uh, uh, provide you waveforms of what's happening on the FPGA. So the waveforms, um, and I'm not sure how visible that is, but uh, uh, it basically provides you with um, readings of the values over time um, on particular wires that you select. Um, and you can set up trigger points for under certain conditions to um, trigger the integrated logic analyzer to start recording. Because the FPGA is run so quick um, and the integrated logic analyzer uses resources on the FPGA, you're limited to a, a very small window. This, uh, it's a lot more painful than kind of printf debugging in the software world, um, but it's uh, definitely necessary. Um, for instance, if you're, if you're sending PCI Express requests and um, you're not receiving a response back, you might set a, um, a, a trigger on, okay, when we send a PCI Express um, request, and then it will capture, let's say, 100 clocks worth of data, and then you can look back and see, okay, yeah, I can see my request going out, I can see there's a valid uh, ready um, signaling going on, but my data was malformed for some reason, and then you can obviously try and trace back. Okay. So um, that's enough background. Um, PCI meets FPGA. Uh, so what we wanted to do, provide was um, PCI DMA as a simple interface, right? Um, we wanted to provide it as a spy interface as well. Um, so we only wanted to provide the kind of simple functions necessary. Um, the search function is, is particularly useful having that on the FPGA because we can massively reduce downstream bandwidth required um, for the SPI consumer um, and also potentially what the SPI consumer wants to send out over uh, radio comms. Um, we could add additional SPI commands. It does require more engineering um, and it, it can be a pain because we're not um, working at software level so you're, you have to design additional circuitry to, to run additional commands. Um, the commands that we provide are asynchronous. That means you initiate them and then collect the results apart from the, read, uh, apart from the write command. So for instance, for the read command, you would send uh, the read command along with a 64-bit address, and then you would send another command um, asking whether the command had finished, uh, or the read command had finished, and also uh, you know, how much was read, and also the data that was read. Um, so just a quick overview of SPI. This is one, spy, one slide overview. Um, SPI is pretty ubiquitous in um, both microcontroller and, and all, all electronic devices. Um, it's really simple to implement. I think my um, implementation for the FPGA is like 20 or 30 lines long. Very easy to get, get uh, moving with. Um, it's also pretty decent performance. You know, it runs at 20 megahertz. That's, um, so you get like 20 megabits. The, uh, the FPGA um, is obviously way more bandwidth than that, but it's, um, it's not insubstantial. Allows us to get um, data off the FPGA and onto the microcontroller. Um, there are other options, um, such as I2C and UART, um, but SPI was pretty easy to get started with. Um, the other thing to note is these are master-initiated master um, commands. So that means when we want to send a command from the microcontroller to the FPGA, we, um, in our case, uh, in reverse to this diagram, we write, raise the um, slave select line, and that tells the FPJ, okay, there's a command coming, and then we send out and receive bytes um, according to some clock that's also sent along, um, along from the microcontroller to the FPJ. Okay, so this is an overview of the, um, what's on the FPGA itself. Each box here is an independent state machine because it's a circuit, they're all running at the same time. Um, uh, so to start off, the red areas in the, in the top left and um, bottom left, 
that's uh, the PCI Express clock domain. So um, there's a transition there um, from the red, from red PCI clock domain into the uh, main logic, which is all in the white domain. And then similarly on the top right, we have the, uh, the blue arrow, which is the spy clock domain. Um, yeah, so basically the spy, um, spy interface is very simple. It takes a one byte argument, which is, um, uh, or one byte argument and 64 bit argu uh, arguments. The first byte, sorry, is the uh, command identifier. Um, the spy module in, in the top right, um, that basically takes the bit stream and, and um, assembles it into bytes. The command processor assembles those bytes into commands and, and with their arguments. Um, so for in the, in the case of a search command, the command will be um, passed to the search and slash probe uh, controller. Um, obviously, it's initiated by the commander and the search probe control itself will take that command and split it up into a bunch of windows and, and pass it on to a number of different uh, search uh, controller units. Um, this is mainly for performance. Um, it can be that certain tags, uh, certain requests will be uh, like fail or stall, and if you have different tags associated with different regions, you can get better performance and pipeline it all. Um, the, the search units themselves contain a little bit of state uh, according to you know, like where they are in memory, and also um, a window of what they've seen so they can uh, yeah, collect search results. Um, the search controller and, and the search units will generate um, uh, TLPs, PCI TLPs that would be passed out um, to the host. Um, and then similarly, we receive back um, TLPs in the, in the top left, and we have a, a stream reassemble um, state machine. Um, yeah, basically when you're receiving uh, TLPs back, um, and as I mentioned earlier, um, for one particular tag, they will be ordered, but it can be that there's data missing um, and, and failures, and, and obviously our search, search controller and read buffer, they expect continuous streams. Um, so we try and reassemble into continuous stream, and also we can send out more um, TLPs if we think we've missed data or something like that. And we can also tag the data stream with useful information, such as the tag that's associated with the data stream and, um, and how many bytes are remaining in a, in a particular request. So for a read request, it just gets passed onto the read buffer. The reason we have a four kilobyte read buffer is there's really no reason to have, uh, to ever read less than four kilobytes, even if the spy command only wants a single byte. Um, the PCI Express is so much quicker that we can just fill a four kilobyte and buffer and, and there's no reason not to. Okay, so there was, there's a number of um, issues we had during this. Uh, one was compiler induced metastability. Um, Basically, because we'd added an additional com uh, compilation step, there was a case where some of our logic was getting optimized out. So this relates back to how those different clock domains and passing data between different clock domains. Um, we'd done the correct approach of double registering data, which is what's required to remove metastability. But there was a, there was a case, and it might have, it maybe was a user error, but it could have also been a compiler error um, that was removing or optimizing, let's say. I think it was uh, shifting how the register, uh, uh, it was retiming some of the registers. So uh, what happens when you have uh, metastability is you have these issues um, uh, where you can, you, have a, you can test a value, let's say x is equal to one, you text it, test it x equal to zero, and, um, and uh, uh, the dif a difference branch will be taken. Instead of Y being assigned zero, it's assigned one. And, uh, and it's basically due to um, the result that actually happens is dependent on the physical uh, characteristics of the FPGA, where some wires are like slightly longer. And, and this shouldn't happen, right? It's, it's a bug, um, of course. There's also like an another, uh, many other pain points. One is kind of the Indian madness of working with um, uh, encapsulation, inside encapsulation, inside encapsulation. Endianus, dealing with different endianus is obviously a very common problem, but um, as we build up encapsulation layers, it just becomes, uh, as, as almost as someone has tried to trip you up, really. Um, so for instance, when you're writing a 64-bit address, 64-bit uh, bit value to 64-bit address, you'll write the high bits of the address, then you write the low bits, and then you write the low bits of the data, and then the high bits of the address, it's backwards, right? Which, um, you know, it's not a difficult thing, but it definitely tripped me up, so, <laughs> um, yeah. And there, there's, there's numerous other things um, that, are, uh, that are, uh, can trip you up. So for instance, before previously I talked about um, the, uh, the length in the address not crossing, um, 
uh, like a, a page boundary, a four kilobyte page boundary. And, um, and uh, also, as I mentioned, having that stuff uh, not fail immediately, having it fail like uh, after you've made some requests can be a real pain in, in debugging those issues. Um, yeah. Okay, so I'll hand over to Joel now for um, integrating with the PyCon module. Thanks, Ben. Awesome. Um, so as we know, there's no radio on the Pico EVB, and we needed a second device to handle communication with the outside world. And we settled on the PyCom family of microcontrollers for developing our prototype. Um, they run MicroPython, so they run an embedded Python interpreter, the idea being that we would drive DMA um, via spy, talking to the FPGA, and, and expose a TCP server that supports reads and writes of physical memory. And PyCom looked to be a perfect candidate for this imp implementing this prototype. Um, Python's easy to develop in. Uh, the PyCom family has modules that include up to five different radio technologies. So you have 802.11bgn, LTE, LoRa, and others. Um, it's easily expanded via SPI, which is what we ended up using, I2C. You have lots of pins available for GPIO. Some of the other platforms we looked at were smaller, but they just didn't have enough pins. And it's pretty tiny. It's not as big as the Pico EVB, but close, 5.5 by 2 centimeters. Um, but there are also challenges working with the PyCom in this context. Um, we're trying to support 64-bit reads and writes, but the PyCom has an extensive dual-core LX6 CPU. It's a 32-bit architecture, so you can't natively represent 64-bit values, um, something to account for. Uh, memory is naturally limited, 4 megs of RAM, 8 megs of flash. Um, even though you're developing in Python, you have to be careful with data copies. Um, heap fragmentation can affect the stability of the device, and we don't want it timing out not being accessible. And you know we're relying on SPI, which is compared to PCI, um, comparatively low bandwidth. Um, but these none of these were deal breakers. Uh, our software accounts for these challenges. And uh, just to give you sort of a visual representation of the software stack on the radio side, so Ben was talking about the, the purple square, the Pico DMA. We're communicating with that over SPI, and then if we follow the bouncing ball, we have uh, more complex layers for communicating uh, with the Pico DMA. We have a raw SPI module, SPI.py. It supports fixed length reads and writes and 32K uh, searches over memory, which is a value that we found stable, but we're hoping to increase. Um, there's a more complex module spy util that supports block-based reads, writes, and searches, so it allows you to operate over larger ranges of memory and sort of abstracts away the, uh, um, the fixed block sizes of the FPGA itself. And the last piece that we implemented that was really important is um, streaming reads and writes. So basically, uh, we have a spy DMA object that um, takes a socket and shoves data out on it um, in response to read and write requests. And I mentioned earlier, we have a server thread um, that takes inbound read and write commands um, in the format that PCI Leech sends with the raw TCP device. Um, so we can, point TC we can point PCI Leech at this thing and um, start reading and writing memory. Uh, in terms of connectivity, just throwing this in as a wiring guide. Um, in the top right, you see the Pico EVB. That's the back of the board. Um, there are general multipurpose I.O. pins on the bottom. Um, they're oriented with pin one at the top, and that connects to the associated pins on the PyCom. Um, you can get wires on DigiKey um, uh, that are quite long, so it's flexible in terms of where you deploy it. Um, and you'll notice that the, uh, the, the, VN, uh, the VN pin is red, and I'll tell you why. Um, there are some fun gotchas as far as integration goes. Um, connecting the 3.3 volt pin on the PyCom to the Pico EVB, um, as you'd expect, would kill the Pico EVB, and I don't recommend doing this two days before the conference. Don't pull a Joel. Um, code uploads uh, often die, and the PyCom becomes unbootable, and you'll want to have a tool handy. In the bottom right, I have my tool that I made, uh, Precision Craftsmanship, and uh, kind of representative of my state of mind throughout this project. Um, you can uh, hold pin 12 high and boot into recovery mode end up doing that a lot. Um, the wireless configuration is brittle and dangerous, so be careful. And now let's try some live demos. So we have the, uh, the NUC box that I mentioned up here. It's running Ubuntu 16.04.06. We have a 480.58 generic kernel, which is supported by PCI Leech. Um, it's a soft target. VTD is disabled. We've disabled kernel ASLR. Not a defense against DMA attacks by any means, um, but it does give us reliable offsets for 
experience in the demo. And this machine happened to be, it happens to be air gapped. Um, there aren't working drivers for that kernel version that are packaged, so it has no connectivity other than the Pico DMA. Um, so let's, uh, let's give this a try. All right, so we will start by connecting. Oh, shit. Sorry, shoot. Uh, how do I do that? There we go. Awesome. Okay, so we've connected to the, um, the, the radio itself. We're going to log in. Uh, black hat, password, here goes nothing. Um, good, and now we have a Python REPL. So now we will run our demo. So far, so good. Um, awesome. So I'm going to bump up the font size a little bit and uh, we'll get started. Um, so we have a little basic system information. Uh, the important thing here is note that the heap is quite small, 400K. Uh, we have a little bit of information about the device itself. It's running at 160 megahertz. Um, here's the pinouts. This is configurable on the PyCom side, which is useful. Um, we have a server running and uh, seems to be alive. His running is true. It's a good sign. Now we'll get into actual communication with the FPGA. So let's test SPI connectivity. And we're running a thousand trials, and we have a failure rate of zero, which is good because during development we did have failure rates that were higher. Um, do a quick read of memory; seems to be working. Now we're going to find the uh, base address. Um, sorry, I hit tab there. Finding the base address of the kernel, um, and we're using search to do so. So that seems to be working well. That's a good sign. And we're going to do a second read of the first page of the Linux kernel. Um, I'm going to skip PCI leech integration because, because of time, but um, we'll see PCI leech in a second. But we can also read and write using uh, PCI leech. And now let's try a write to memory. So nice quiet location in kernel memory, all nulls. Now we will do a write. Here you see pretty crude black hat logo. And uh, okay, the device seems pretty healthy. Um, so let's move into something a little more interesting. Um, so uh, we're actually able to compute the offsets that PCI Leach requires FPGA side, but in the interest of time, uh, I'm supplying them on the command line. And now we're trying to load a, a kernel mode implant. Takes a little, takes a minute or two. I think if we look over here, yep, we got activity here. Reads and writes, looks healthy. It's, uh, it's a lot slower here than it is elsewhere. There's our first write. Okay, good. Um, so here's the offsets that we're using. Um, we've inserted code into the kernel, and it looks like PCI Leach is happy. So um, we've now compromised this air gap machine, and now we're going to pull sensitive credentials using this software implant. PCI Leach, of course, doing the heavy lifting here. Um, so we'll start with some user credentials. That seems to be working. Um, I think we only have a minute and a half left, so I am going to switch back to slides, but long story short, pulling credentials works. Um, we can do whatever we want at this point. All right, so just some, some quick takeaways. DMA implants are more flexible, as we saw, give us new variations and attacks. Uh, the Pico EVB is definitely a great platform for DMA research, and we dealt with plenty of challenges um, developing a working prototype, but we were able to overcome them. Um, we're planning to release all our software. Check out github.com Pico DMA. Um, the radio software should be up there today. I just haven't posted it yet. Um, FPGA software is coming. Ben's just going to clean it up a little bit. We do have a uh, PCI Leech client that you can use with the radio and um, other useful tools that we've developed. And Ben, we have, we have 40 seconds. Can you just pull the terminal up again? Let's just see if it worked, just so you guys know we're not pulling your leg. Yeah, okay. So here we have AWS, AWS creds pulled from the device. 
And 30 seconds, so I don't think we have time for questions now, but there is a, uh, a follow-up room and we're happy to do live demos and um, answer questions there. So thank you so much, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Thanks to Ulf and all the other researchers I mentioned.